Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of Dome to Home, Perseverance to Mars. My name is Jeremy. I'll be navigating, uh, doing everything that you guys see up here, uh, this direction on the Dome Live. And above me, we have Ramy. Hi, it's me, Ramy. I'm an astronomy student at CU Boulder. I'm a presenter at Fisk Planetarium, and I am thrilled to be back here with you all for our Fall Dome to Home series. So behind the scenes, we also have our good friend Tara, you might remember from last week, she will be in the chat um, and she will be answering any questions you have or sending them my way uh, to make sure they're answered here live on the video. So thank you, Tara. And thank you, Jeremy, for all the nice visuals. So let's get right to it. <laughs> so today we're gonna be talking about something really exciting, Martians but not like the kind you see in movies and comic books, like the real kind, because today's dome to home subject is the search for life on Mars. So Earth is currently the only place that we have 100% surely and completely without a doubt determined that there is life of any sort. All you have to do is, you know, look in the mirror, there's life here. We have a lot of decent candidates for other locations, though, um, that could have life now or could have had it in the past, uh, but so far nothing's been directly detected and confirmed. So scientists believe, though, that Mars is one of those really good candidates. But what exactly would make Mars such a good place for life? Because I don't know, Jeremy, I'm looking at it right now, and it doesn't look like a really great place. No, definitely. <laughs> Not looking like a place where I would see any type of the life that we see here on Earth, any of these pictures. Uh, so I guess we should probably get into it, huh? Yeah. You know, Mars, it's dry, it's barren, there's no atmosphere, very little atmosphere. This isn't a very welcoming planet. So when we look at it, we kind of wonder, well, what kind of life would even exist in something like this? Why are we sending this Perseverance rover, or any of our old rovers, to look for anything? What are they doing? So what we want to look for is really evidence of past life because we're not sure that much could exist on Mars at the moment. But if we were to turn back the clock, Mars looks a lot nicer. Takes a little bit of time to turn back yeah. the clock sometimes. <laughs> Some, sometimes the clocks fight with you. There we go. <laughs> this is all live. So here we go. Mars looks a lot nicer here. This is looking a lot more like Earth, even, you can see. We've got water, we've got continents, and we don't know if it was brown or green, but we're taking artistic liberties because if there's that much water, who's to say that there wouldn't be life? So, you know, there are a few things that we believe are necessary for life. There's water, like we see here. There's energy. There's protection from anything harmful. And then there are also certain types of chemical building blocks that we look for. So, ah, yes, so we can see water. We can see protection from that, whatever attack the sun is doing over there. Um, so the sun shoots out a lot of like solar wind and radiation and particles, and we need protection from that. And then you can see DNA there, um, which is made of these building blocks. And we, we remember these chemical building blocks actually with a pretty funny little acronym called CHNOPS. So that's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, CHNOPS. There it is. And uh, those are the types of elements that we're looking for in a place. So we're looking for those types of elements. We're looking for energy and we're looking for water. Those are the three biggest things. And time, as we know, exists. It's the key. So, you gotta have, gotta have time for all three gotta, of those things to hopefully coalesce and create yeah. something like life. Absolutely. So keep an eye out for all these things. So let's take a look at this past version of Mars. So we can see it's got that water. Like, I, like we said earlier, it's got all that water. You can't really 100% tell um, based on this, but it does also have an atmosphere. And it also at this time had something called a magnetosphere or magnetic field, which could protect any life there, protect the planet from dangerous solar radiation or solar winds that we saw earlier in that picture. Um, then we have that energy from the sun. Then with that atmosphere, it can hold enough heat that the water can stay 
liquid on that Mars there. So without the atmosphere, Mars was just too far away to keep it liquid and you know, keep everything there. So with the atmosphere, with this water, all of this uh, protection, it's a prime location for life to develop. You know, we've got everything we need here on this ancient Mars. But a few billion years ago, Mars began to lose its atmosphere. And we're going to talk more about that in a few weeks. Uh, but basically, it lost uh, some of its protection or all of its protection. And the atmosphere got stripped away slowly. And then it lost all this water. And as you can see, you know, Mars just, ooh. I love that visual where you have all the, that's the solar radiation, solar particles, solar wind hitting the atmosphere and it's stripping it all away. So over time, you end up with uh, the Mars that we know and love, the dry, barren wasteland. So Mars really isn't too friendly anymore because of this loss of atmosphere, the loss of water and everything. Uh, but there could have been life there. So Mars lost that protection, its magnetic field, about four billion years ago. And we do have conclusive evidence of life on Earth going back maybe three and a half or so billion years ago. And we believe life could go back even further. So taking Mars you know, from a habitable oasis to a barren desert took a very long time. So it's reasonable that on the exact same time scale as Earth, Mars could have developed simple life just like Earth. If you saw it had a lot of Earth-like conditions, Earth had life, it, you know, it follows that there could be something there. And early life on Earth was very, very simple. You know, the earliest known life forms on Earth are microorganisms. So extremely tiny life forms often made of only one cell or like here, you have a lot of one cell organisms here. This is the sort of thing you might see um, like early, early life um, on Earth, like the very first, the very first life. How many times can I say life in this presentation? It's okay. <laughs> so they're made of like one cell, a small collection of cells. You know, the first life was these multi, uh, single celled or unicellular organisms. So multi celled organisms. Um, things with more than one cell, things that are more complicated. So having more than one cell didn't appear until maybe two billion years ago or less. And it took quite a long time to get anything complex involved. So when we look for life on Mars, we're looking for life forms more reminiscent of these early forms of life on Earth. And the earliest plants and animals, for example, evolved less than one billion years ago. So by then, Mars, instead of looking like that beautiful oasis, looked a lot more like it does today. So our expectations for life on Mars, they aren't quite as complex as we see here on Earth. We don't expect to find like Martian squirrels or Martian mosquitoes or Martian velociraptors. It'd be pretty cool, but we don't expect that. You know, we, we expect to find some very, very simple organisms, much like the ones that existed on Earth when the two planets were much more similar along pretty much the same time scale. So this means that we kind of have a decent idea of what sort of signs we're looking for, because we do see evidence of ancient life on Earth fairly often. You know, for example, the oldest undisputed sign of life on here, here on Earth is a rock is a type of rock in Western Australia called a stromatolite. And it dates back, there it is, about three and a half billion years. And that's very conclusive. Definitely decided that this is about three and a half billion years old. So the layers you see in the rock, they're from ancient bacteria. So biological processes, they leave records of these rocks like these. So as the bacteria do their thing, you end up with all of these layers and it ends up kind of fossilizing into this rock. So we also have um, other ways of kind of tracking down ancient life. Um, you've probably heard we found dinosaurs by fossils. You can also find fossils of ancient like, microorganisms. So these are called like <laughs> micro fossils, <laughs> surprise. Um, and they're kind of difficult to find because they're so small. Um, but these could go back maybe over 4 billion years, these microfossils. It's kind of debated. Um, the ones that they've found that they believe go back over 4 billion years, those were only really discovered and published about a few years ago. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, but again, that really shows that the time scale does match up, that there could have been something that developed on Mars, considering how similar it was to Earth. 
So it's, it's things like this rock or these microfossils that Perseverance is gonna look for. So to do this, to look for all this cool, neat stuff, Perseverance has been outfitted with some incredible instruments that can tell us all about the composition and textures of the rocks, for example. Um, it will go through the rocks and the sediment search through and take all that uh, data to tell us what those rocks are made out of. They can tell us um, if they've got those chnops <laughs> or not. <laughs> we can look for that kind of layered texture like we saw with those stromatolites. Um, you know, different evidence like that. Um, it's also going to catalog some of these samples to return to Earth in the future so that we can study them in our bigger and better laboratories because as fantastic as Perseverance is, you cannot take an entire huge high-tech top-of-the-line building size laboratory uh, to Mars on that rover. <laughs> so as much as we can do, and we can do so much with this, um, we're going to get better information when we bring it back to Earth. So we might miss things being so far away and, and limited like that. And that'll be the first time that we'll actually be bringing anything back from Mars. Uh, usually to get pieces from Mars, you have to depend on having meteorites from Mars. So it'll be really exciting to actually have in hand <laughs> some Martian rocks. So we do also want to make sure that we're going to the right place though. You know, and the biggest hint uh, that life was there is, you know, was there water? And there was. So we want to look for where the water was. And we do see a lot of evidence of water on Mars. Mm -hmm. So these two pictures, actually, that uh, we've placed up there now, uh, the image on the top is actually an image taken of uh, the Earth. And you can see these nice, uh, pretty clearly structured river channels. Um, and so when we've sent previous spacecraft to Mars, we've been uh, taking images of what looks to be very, very similar patterns, um, uh, river channels on Mars. And we've also types of patterns in uh, river deltas. So where a river kind of meets the ocean um, and kind of spreads out in, in like kind of fans and things like that, um, kind of like the Nile Delta here shown at the bottom, um, on Mars, we can see very, very similar patterns. Yeah, so river deltas are, so glad you brought them up, really great places for life. You know, river deltas, it's where river that are, rivers are full of life and they flow into a lake or an ocean that's also full of life. And that river flowing carries in sediment and it brings in that life, brings in that sediment and they make river deltas fantastic locations to look for life. Uh, which is why when they were looking into areas to land perseverance, a river delta ended up being chosen. So we have Jezero Crater here, and you can see the big river delta. And Jezero Crater isn't that small crater, that's a crater in a crater. <laughs> um, but you can see the river, you can see the canyon up there from the river and where it spilled out into this lake. The lake was about the size of Lake Tahoe. So you have what could have been a very rich ecosystem in that river, in that lake, on that shore. Um, and with all of the sediment deposited, um, it could have you know, preserved and buried this evidence of life here in this delta, uh, which makes it a fantastic location. So there's kind of their target area right there. Um, so it's hoping to go into the river delta. You can see it's in the hoping to land in the lake or delta and get around through, go up to the crater rim. It's going to try to look at as many things as possible. So lake, delta, shore, and where it was dry land, I suppose. And uh, that should give us a really good idea of what was happening there um, in the past, those billions of years ago. So if there was you know, life on Mars, this would have been, or could have been a, a hot spot, like a, an amazing area for it. So that's kind of what we're looking for. We're digging around for the remnants of that life there. So, you know, then you have the question, of course, I'm sure you're at home wondering, okay, but does life still exist there? Um, and if so, you know, what might it look like? So if life existed there before, you know, couldn't it just adapt to these harsher conditions over time? And a good number of scientists do say that it is possible, though it would have to be a very hardy organism. You know, Mars 
has no surface water, it's extremely cold, it's unprotected from harmful radiation, there's barely any atmosphere, etc, etc. Mars is great, but it's kind of barren. It's Surviving all that is unthinkable for a human, or a squirrel, or a mosquito, or a velociraptor. So you kind of think, well, there's not going to be anything there. But oddly enough, there are certain types of organisms found here on Earth that can survive in extreme conditions like this. They're called, surprise, extremophiles, because they like extreme conditions. So everywhere we look on Earth, we find life, including sulfuric springs and inside sea ice and inside the Chernobyl plant and even inside of rocks. There are even, you know, organisms that can survive the vacuum of space, like tardigrades, which personally kind of freak me out a little bit. They're a lot. <laughs> I was talking earlier, imagine looking in your microscope and you see that looking back at you, discovering that just does not sound like a pleasant day to me. For something so small, they do kind of uh, look a little menacing. Just, just a little. A lot of people think they're cute though, uh, but they can actually survive the vacuum of space. They don't really like it. Um, but you know, if something like this can survive the vacuum of space, if we can find things inside of rocks, if there's stuff living in a place with such high radiation as Chernobyl, it's possible that something could still survive on Mars. You know, life really does find a way. And hopefully we'll find out someday soon if it found a way on Mars or if it's still finding a way. And I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So if you have anything you want to know about Mars, life on Mars, life in the solar system, space in general, go ahead and drop them in the chat, whichever direction that is from my head, and we can answer them here live. Down below or maybe to the side, maybe that way. <laughs> is it side, down, somewhere? Somewhere around there. Uh, when we're waiting for some questions to start rolling in here, we'll throw up Another uh, place on Earth that uh, shows that although, you know, what we think of life kind of living above the surface, um, you know, the more places we start looking for life, the more places we are able to actually find it. So these are some, some tube worms and some black smokers way down uh, at the, on the ocean's floor where there's hardly any sunlight, if, uh, if any at all. Uh, not a place we would think to be looking for life, yet it finds a way. It really does. Just anywhere Jurassic you look, Park plug. it's gonna be there. <laughs> we talked about this earlier, I haven't seen it. <laughs> so while we're waiting for people to think of a question, um, there is actually something that was a pretty big talking point last week. Um, this was uh, Venus. I don't know if anybody saw any of these new news articles, uh, but there was this big hullabaloo about there potentially being life um, on Venus. So I just want to talk about that a little bit, just while we're waiting. Uh, so what they found, what scientists found, was something called phosphine in the atmosphere. And phosphine, you might remember phosphorus being one of the chnops, for example, you know. So something like that could just exist um, or it could be a byproduct of life. And the thing is, phosphine just kind of doesn't last very long. So if you have a lot of phosphine, something does need to keep resupplying it. And, you know, there's something that could supply it, um, like there could be volcanoes supplying it. But to do that, Venus would have to have like 2,000 times Earth's volcanic activity to be able to supply that amount of phosphine. Um, so there are a lot of ideas on explanations for finding such a weird chemical. Um, and it was found in the atmosphere specifically, not on the, not on the ground. Uh, there are a lot of explanations and life is one of them, but there's also chemistry we don't understand um, that could have done this. It's not direct evidence of life or anything, but there's evidence of something weird. We only have so much data and sure it's possible that there could be life in uh, the Venusian, is that it? <laughs> Venusian <laughs> atmosphere. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up any UFO posters just yet. I would put up a UFO poster, but not for this. <laughs> Maybe somewhere down the line, uh, you know, if there is something there, you know, more uh, more observations and more research uh, could maybe uh, reveal that. So 
it's something really to definitely exciting. Keep, keep on your radars. It's really exciting for people who study Venus because we don't get a lot of missions to Venus. We get, mm -hmm. we, Mars is the place to go. It's a lot nicer than Venus. Look at it. Look how, look how marvelous it is. Can't go wrong. Mar, Marsalis? No. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> that was a bad joke. Let's see, Tara, we have any questions coming in? Let's see if we got anything. Nothing yet? No questions about life on Mars. It just learned everything about life on Mars. That's okay. I think you just covered it quite well, Rami. They're, they're experts now. I will expect them to give the video back at me afterward. Let's go see, here's a question. Yeah. Oh, go for it. Oh, no, I was just going to say, whenever, uh, when you're talking about the, whatever question we're getting, I'm going to try to navigate us to Jezero Crater on in our system, see, Ooh, if, we can, yes. see if we can find it. So a question I've been asked before, um, just while we're waiting, is how do we know that if we, if we go to Mars and then we find life, how do we know it wasn't something that was brought on our spacecraft with us? Um, and I like this question because I get to talk about planetary protection, which is an actual like unit. It's an actual job to be a planetary protector. Um, their whole job is to like disinfect, clean, sanitize, shove bits in the oven to make sure everything is dead, not there um, on the spacecraft before they send it out. Because you want to send out everything clean. You don't want to accidentally introduce something bad to Mars or bring anything with you. Um, so that's like an entire job. Um, what's, what's fun is that they're still doing their job totally normally with COVID because everything that they usually do is 20,000 times more sanitary than any other workplace. Um, but it's a really important job. I mean, what if there is life and we end up introducing an invasive species like penicillin ends up running rampant across Mars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's one of the major concerns for, uh, you know, traveling to other planets. And, you know, we don't want to pollute other planets. We don't want to pollute our own planet. Um, but that's a very real concern uh, in the astronomical community and just in, you know, in the science community uh, as a whole is if we're going to go explore the solar system and, you know, the depths of space, we want to make sure that we are actually being pretty uh, aware of our, I guess, pollution and if, uh, make sure we're not putting anything there that wasn't there before we got there. Just wanna make sure we're not leaving too large of footprints or causing any issues, exactly. but we still wanna learn, discover, and you know, satisfy our curiosity there. Um, but if we're all good on knowledge here, um, then I guess we can wrap it up. If anything occurs to you after the fact, like the second we go off, something occurs to you, feel free to leave a comment or email us and we can go ahead and answer them next week. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. I had a blast. I hope Jeremy and Tara also had a blast. Um, if you like this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe it uh, or subscribe to Fisk if you haven't already and um, turn on notifications so you can get alerts for more videos like this and definitely come back next week. We're going to be doing this series for a number of weeks. Um, next week we're talking about, let me double check here. I think we're talking about, is it water? Water in the rocks. Yeah. We're water go, in the rocks. Go so... in depth about searching for water in these, in the Martian uh, surface. So if you were curious about, uh, water on Mars. Next week is the time to come back. Um, same time, same place. Um, but we're really looking forward to having a great series this fall. Um, I had fun and I can't wait to talk with you all again. Bye. Yep. Take care, everybody.